increased. Oh, this has really um, changed the standard of care of my practice and why, you know, for example, if, if, if it ever does happen that my uh, Artemis or my insight later on was, um, you know, not functioning well, it would really cripple my clinic, even though, <laughs> even though no one else was using it around the world. So that's kind of like a, a, a uh, gives you a, a data point. Um, and, you know, my financial interest is because I, I obviously was the first to think about this idea of scanning the epithelium and the cornea uh, at, the, at a time when everyone said it was a, a silly idea uh, of no use. Uh, and sticking to it uh, for many, many years, uh, it ends up being obviously of, of a lot of use. And I was very lucky in that respect because I did invest a lot of my time into it. So this is, you know, the uh, prototype imaging that we got in originally uh, from the engineer prototypes. And, and as you know, this is an incredibly sophisticated scanning motion mechanism. Uh, it can move the transducer in any direction. So if, it, if, if you wanted, you could program it to follow the contour of the sclera, then the cornea, then, you know, you could do anything you want. Um, so it's a bit over, over sophisticated um, for most applications, but there it is. Um, and it's been FDA approved for many years now, and it's CE marked approved in Europe. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, the four major areas of how we use VHF digital ultrasound, um, obviously in the epithelium and intrastromerally within the cornea, uh, but for anterior segment, anterior chamber um, uh, modalities but then the posterior chamber modalities. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of OCT because, you know, clearly that's another technology that has a lot of overlapping applications. But, you know, as I said, you know, I started measuring the epithelium in 1991. Um, I was told it was of no use by everyone. Uh, I was presenting all over the place as a, as a resident and as a um, fellow. And, you know, I always used to get my slot on stage, but... <laughs> Not much, not much interest. Um, but I managed to pepper the literature. I have over forty publications on just epithelium, so not, not, not all the other applications, but just on the epithelium. So you know, a lot of my friends always say that my career has been very superficial. <laughs> um, but you know, we learned a lot, and um, one of the things that's become the most uh, so sort of the driving force behind. Uh, commercialization of this technology and the driving force behind the commercialization of anterior segment OCT was when I started to describe how we could use it for screening for keratoconus. Uh, and in fact, I was showing data that effectively using epithelium, you could increase your surgical volume by 7% and avoid operating on these very rare corneas that look normal but aren't because they're subclinical keratoconics. So, the whole of epithelial uh, application and screening for keratoconus is something that's becoming mainstream now. It's taken a long time, but it's becoming mainstream. You, most of you know that, you know, in the you know keratoconus was diagnosed only from the front surface, and then the mid '90s we got back surface from orb scan. So I introduced the epithelium, you know, in the early 2000s. This generated the interest in the industry. So now we have epithelial maps from OCT machines. But essentially, this has been, you know, really a long, um, long time in coming. Um, and what what was interestingly difficult to publish because uh, this paper was rejected from ophthalmology by some very backwards thinking as editors. But it was it's my most cited paper now. It was sent to the Journal of Refractive Surgery, and that is you know, the normal epithelial thickness profile, you know, how often do you get an anatomy paper, you know, in eyes, you know, in, in the, in the 21st century. So what we found was quite striking. We found that the epithelial thickness profile was not a single layer of thickness. We found that, well, it was 50 microns in the middle, like many people knew from histology. But what we found was that there was a superior to inferior difference and a nasal to temporal difference in thickness. And this profile was had mirror asymmetry. And so this is interesting because it led to uh, pr essentially proving how it was that we understood the epithelium forms and why it becomes a certain shape and why it changes in LASIK and, 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 and all that. 
we've described how, you know, as the cone progresses in keratoconus, so the epithelium becomes thinner in the over the cone, but the donut around uh, the cone, the donut of thicker epithelium becomes thicker. Um, we, we described, you know, the differences between keratoconus and normal many, many years ago, and then chose to exploit this difference. And, you know, if we just look at model, the model here from a very old slide, you know, we think of the front surface, the stromal surface, and the back surface of the cornea, and the epithelium is obviously between those two surfaces. In keratoconus, the cornea bends forward and becomes thinner here. The epithelium becomes thinner over the cone, but thicker around it, that's the donut. And so that, that that's kind of the obvious case of keratoconus versus normal. But then you have the situation where the back surface is only slightly changed, yoked to the front surface, but the epithelium has managed to completely absorb the front surface extrusion of the stromal surface. And so the epithelium hides the cone that is on the front surface. And this is explains why in the 90s we were saying, yes, back surface is very important for screening for keratoconus. There was still 10, there was still 100%, well, half the people in the room in 2010 at this meeting at the ASCRS thinking that it wasn't necessary to look at the back surface. I remember that debate. But what really got the juices flowing on epithelial mapping commercially was when I described that you could exclude keratoconus in a cornea that had inferior steepening if you could show that the epithelium was thick where the steepening on topography could be seen. Because obviously you can't have a thick epithelium over a cone. You'd have thinning of the epithelium. And so this excluding of keratoconus became a volume booster. And I published a paper, 1500 eyes screened by back surface, 10% of which went into ultrasound to distinguish the epithelial thickness profile. 84% of these were recovered for surgery. And, you know, if you do the maths, that's 7% more surgery, and only 1.4% of the eyes rejected for keratoconus, even though 9.2% of the eyes were suspicious from just looking at the back surface. So you've got your back surface over-enthusiastic Bell and Ambrosio algorithm, and then you take the patient to the insight, get an epithelial map, and exclude keratoconus despite the Bell and Ambrosio being yellow or red. And that's a money maker. So that suddenly excited everyone. Uh, Ron Silverman, who you know developed all this with with me, he did all the all the mechanics and all the um, uh, computer science around this. We got a, an NIH grant of a few million dollars. We did an AI algorithm for epithelial analysis, and we found extraordinarily uh, that we could detect keratoconus with 95% sensitivity and almost 100% specificity. So if, if ultrasound says it's keratoconus, it's very likely to say it's keratoconus. Whereas, as you know, the specificity and uh, sensitivity of tomography, no matter what algorithm you look at, is way lower than this. So using epithelium, we've got, we can see corneas that are completely normal in hyperobes with best spectacle corrected vision and low and flat corneas who classify as entirely normal on a Bell and Ambrosio, but in whom the epithelium has the donut shape. And so this is absolutely a keratoconic eye. And that little tiny little, I don't know, you know, just the little, uh, I don't know what on the back surface here, in fact, was the herald of a keratoconic um, cornea. And that would not have been detected on the front surface alone. And it would not have been detected by the BAD, the big D. So, but the algorithm that we developed with Ron, yes, absolutely, big time uh, keratoconic detection. So here's a scary example where you'd go and do surgery on an eye and then it'll get ectasia and you wouldn't know why. The ectasia without a cause case, you know. Um, so for us, um, epithelial thickness, you know, uh, screening for keratoconus is a big deal. And whereas I will show in a minute we use OCT a lot. We still have about 10, 12% of patients that have to move on from OCT to ultrasound because ultrasound is more accurate and more specific. 
Um, so other applications of epithelial thickness measurement is in the ability to do much higher levels of hyperopic LASIK than you otherwise would have been able to do if you were only looking at Ks, because you can have steep corneas with thick epithelium and flat corneas with thin epithelium. And this is where hyperopic LASIK got a bad reputation because we were just using Ks to determine if we could steepen anymore. And it turns out it's the epithelial thickness profile that matters, not the case. And they can, they can actually be uh, contrary to each other. So we published plus four to plus seven uh, with only 0.4% loss of two lines. And that's because we're guided by epithelial thickness profile. So, you know, a whole area of ophthalmology that is neglected, which is hyperopic LASIK, is totally opened up by using epithelial monitoring. We've published two, three papers on this already. The other thing, of course, is is the is diagnosis in complex cases. And, you know, uh, I have a reputation for being very good at complication repair. It's only because I had the best teacher. The best teacher was very high frequency digital ultrasound. And I was really the, the student of this of, of this imaging technique and biometry technique enabled me to make the epithelium of each of these complex cases and be able to see what was going on on the stromal surface. Uh, and we've published numerous papers on how we've used the diagnostic power of epithelial mapping in the ability to treat complications within the, on the cornea. So if we think about the intrastromal applications, here we have the advantage with ultrasound that the signal to noise ratio of the flap interfaces is much higher with ultrasound than it is with OCT. And so whenever you look at a cornea even 10 years after lasik you can still see the interface light up like a christmas tree all over whereas of course we know that with oct after a few months this tends to fade and this means that even 10 years later we can map the thickness profile of a hansetone flap for example and we know exactly what the rst is in three dimensions as well so this intrastromal mapping is important in enhancement surgery um, topography guided surgery has finally reached the US and there's a lot of excitement about that. Well, congratulations for, 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 for doing that. But you know, the ablation profiles are asymmetric and being able to measure what the residual stromal thickness is, where the deepest ablation occurs is important because you just look at the maximum ablation depth and then look at the RST in the middle, you may not be able to do the case. But if you do topographic mapping of the RST, well, then you have a, a method of, of knowing exactly where you are. This cannot really be done very well with OCT because you can only see the interface in very patchy areas. Here's an example of a, of a Hansetone flap uh, that was obviously not calibrated properly on the pressure uh, head. And so the surgeon was creating 250 micron flaps. Um, and had this patient had this flap lifted to do a night vision repair with the new newly found topography guided systems, you'd end up conducing ectasia in this patient. So um, we also use obviously this layered pachymetry, for example, in SMILE, we're able to find the interface, find the epithelial thickness profile and plan the LASIK flap below the epithelium, but above the SMILE interface taking into account the standard deviation of these three devices and, and the three surfaces so that we know, uh, you know where we are and we're able to do a, a very quick healing, easy to do LASIK procedure on top of a smile rather than having to condemn the patient to PRK, essentially the most invasive procedure for the patient after they've come to you for the least invasive smile procedure. Um, we have some esoteric publications where we had free caps that had been rotated uh, numerous times and couldn't find the right rotation. We did a thickness analysis of the flap. We're able to rotate the flap back in place. Best spectacle corrected vision restored. Just knife and knife and fork. You know, uh, easy to do. Um, you know, anatomically based surgery, right? Uh, being able to examine the individual layers of the cornea, where the epithelial ingrowth is, where stromal components of the original flap are, where there's melt, being able to analyze the anatomy of flaps and, and is also very powerful when you're trying to help patients. Being able to quantify the actual thickness of this, for example, um, apical syndrome in this 
small optical zone hyperopic treatment done, you know, in a Vizix and a small optical zone patient got apical syndrome, being able to fix this uh, by direct measurement of the thickness and PTK, very powerful again. So, you know, intrastromal applications are, are, are really important when you're thinking about therapeutics. Now, if we go to the anterior chamber, well, this is where, you know, glaucoma specialists are getting very excited about all the different dimensions that can be uh, derived from anatomical and, uh, you know, measurements from the angle, um, angle depth, uh, uh, in, you know, um, scleral spur, scleral spur measurements, you know, for, uh, for ICL sizing, anterior chamber measurements, obviously a lot of overlap with OCT, um, but with ultrasound, you're more likely to be able to see Schlem's canal, you're more likely to be able to follow the pathway of these, um, uh, you know, mini implants that glaucoma specialists are using, uh, because OCT obviously is blocked um, by sclera mostly. Um, there's a whole area of research that hasn't been explored um, from Jack Holman's lab, uh, where I was working in the early 90s of tissue characterization of ultrasound, you can do spectral analysis of ultrasound and get a lot of um, uh, it's almost histological information about uh, tissues. It's like a like a like an acoustic biopsy, I think, is what Jack Coleman really called it. But that's a whole area that could be used in glaucoma for uveal scleral outflow analysis and, and and things that are very difficult to measure otherwise in the clinic. But I want to get to the big the big one here, and the big one is the posterior chamber. And obviously, you know, um, the posterior chamber is the ICL. And, you know, OCT has been brought in as the new kid on the block for OCT for ICL surgery. And that's great. Uh, you can measure the white to white and size your ICL, or you can try and uh, measure the sulcus, to, you know, the, the, the anterior chamber width, but you're either measuring the corneal diameter from the outside or the corneal diameter from the inside. And then you're making an assumption of what the posterior chamber dimensions are, right? So, you know, whether that's larger or smaller than expected is the outliers. And, you know, we have outliers in ICL surgery and there aren't many of them, it's a few percent, but exchange surgery is traumatic for the cornea, for the endothelium, for the patient's psychology and for the surgeon. And, you know, it should be avoidable because this is quite a simple problem actually. Understanding where the zonular plane is, is important for cataract surgery if we're going to finally attack uh, ELP, which hasn't been done yet, a whole other area of science that hasn't been addressed. But you see, where this zonular plane is cannot be seen by any form of OCT, even with a dilated pupil. And you can, you, you've got studies trying to extrapolate lens, um, lens visible via the dilated pupil, but that doesn't actually, hasn't led to any improvements in IOL calculations. So as you can see, high frequency ultrasound gives us exquisite uh, detail of the posterior chamber, including zonular uh, position. And this, as you can imagine, can be exploited for making the ICL a bulletproof technology from a very good technology. And understanding the exact sulcus and the exact zonular plane and being able to measure the exact lens rise from the zonular plane and being able to therefore predict ICL separation, that's the key. And, and those of us, uh, which I'm gonna talk to you about now uh, using our new formulas are very excited about the ICL in a way that we weren't never that excited as we were as we are now. Post-operative, of course, we love our OCTs because you could just do a quick uh, scan in air and get a very quick measurement of the volt, but you can't actually see, well, behind the iris. And that means that in a high myopic uh, ICL where the thickest part of the ICL is now hiding behind the iris, no information. So while you can get the central volt, you can't get the information from the, where the ICL is thickest, and you can't therefore map the volt separation. And let's be honest, that is one of the things that if I had an ICL in my eye, that's what I would want to know is how far is this thing from my, from my crystalline lens. 
Not only that, but we're able to see where the foot plates are, and this pertains to ICL volt, as I will show you in a minute. All of these dimensions, unattainable by OCT. What happens if you have a tilted ICL? We see these frequently, actually. Well, in my early ICL days, I really didn't know what I was doing, but thanks to being able to monitor by ultrasound postoperatively, I started to learn about where I was putting these ICLs. And I started to learn that the placement of the haptics and of the foot plates could actually be a little bit into the sulcus in the armpit, or I could actually, if I manipulate behind the iris, push it down to rest more on the zonules. And these tilted uh, um, ICLs often are malpositions that don't require an exchange. They just require a little bit of repositioning, a lot less traumatic. Here's a hyperopic ICL with a little bit of tilt. And you can see that, yeah, uh, I had one of the foot plates in the armpit, in the sulcus. The other one was sitting on the zonules. So again, these are the things that you would never know. You know, if you don't measure it, you don't know it. If you don't see it, you'll never know. So all of this operating behind the dark side of the moon uh, becomes, you know, demystified. So when we look at the applications of OCT, and we know that uh, some prototypes, I received one of the very first prototypes from OptoView uh, that David Huang was involved in developing, and they developed an algorithm for doing epithelial mapping, and they showed that they could distinguish keratoconus from normals. Well, that's fine, because you already knew they were keratoconics. And there are a number of publications now from OCT saying you can distinguish keratoconics from normals, but that's obviously pointless because if you already know it's a keratoconus eye, what's the point of getting the epithelial map to prove that? What's important is the corneas where you don't know if they're keratoconic and whether the epithelium gives you the answer, and that requires the micro precision. So when we think about how in our clinic, how OCTs are used, well, about 80% of our epithelial applications, we do it by OCT. For intrastromal, it's less because we can't always see interfaces uh, with OCT. Anterior chamber, it's the same, OCT and ultrasound, and you know, obviously OCT is more convenient. So for anterior chamber, dimensional stuff, yeah, we just use the OCT. But for the posterior chamber, zero, right? There, there is no application on OCT. And so here's where our insight gets it constant workout all the time. Now, I'm not allergic to OCT. We have uh, in our own clinic, we have um, two Avantis. Uh, we have five uh, MS39s from CSO and three Cirrus OCTs with the anterior segment lens. So we're, we love OCT, but we still have to use ultrasound. And why? Because it raises our standard of care. And it raises our standard of care in epithelial screening, as I mentioned, because OCT is not actually measuring the epithelium. It's measuring the epithelium and the tear film as one. And there are, here's one publication showing how the tear film changes in thickness even just during and between blinks. But we can see here an example of a pre-op visit from a patient with a ropey tear film and there is the OCT epithelial map. And here is after a month of, you know, tear film, meibomium gland, gland dysfunction therapy. And you can see that the tear film is in better shape and the epithelial thickness profile has changed a lot. Well, has it? No, the tear film has changed and it has made the epithelium look different on the same cornea. The epithelium is the same, right? Uh, so, We've done a lot of work and published work on comparing a high resolution OCT with, you know, our, our, our arc scan insight. And we found that there was very little difference in the central thickness measurements. They've obviously calibrated them very well using our device, but the differences become greater as you go out towards the periphery. And as you know, OCT only gets out to the six millimeter zone ultrasound gets out to nine or 10 millimeters, but we're restricting the analysis to the six millimeters. And you can see that already by the, by the six millimeter, the three millimeter radius, there's already a three micron difference 
uh, in thickness of the epithelium, and that is where the cones are, right, in these, in these virgin eyes, in that three millimeter zone. So that's why sometimes we're missing keratoconus that is visible with ultrasound. Post LASIK, they're, they've definitely not done their calculations because the refractive index of the epithelium is obviously different. So that doesn't affect us in ultrasound, but it does affect OCT. And you can see that there's a lot of difference now between the actual values derived by the gold standard of measurement, which is ultrasound, and the OCT, which depends on a knowledge of refractive indices, which is obviously not known for epithelium post LASIK. The other thing about we, we noticed about our OCT devices is that if you just move the cursor one one box, like just one one little box on the screen, you could be moving, you know, up to nine or eight, nine microns just by one little box. So the resolution is lower. And this is because the signal to noise ratio of internal corneal measurements is much lower in a transparent cornea than it is with ultrasound where you have interfaces that are really echoing physical discontinuities. So ultrasound is much better at interfaces within the cornea than light uh, because the cornea is transparent. So that's, you know, that's a good thing. Um, and our surface localization of 0.87 microns per surface is what leads to this extraordinary accuracy that we can get in mapping flaps, for example, in three dimensions. Here you can see at one year, this is a, a, a smile case that was aborted and we made a flap over that smile. We left the lenticule in. So that lenticule interface is still visible by ultrasound Here's the flap, the very thin flap that I made to do LASIK on top. And you can see that by OCT, we're barely able to see anything of this sort, right? There's just no detail. And this is only one year later. So ultrasound has its place when you need to see internal interfaces once the edema has gone out. Um, as I showed you earlier, 10 years later, you've got interfaces just lighting up like Christmas trees very, very easily because of physical discontinuities from ultrasound, different from trying to get an optical discontinuity in what is a transparent, you know, uh, a membrane, the cornea. So, for example, in borderline cases where we're told that the cornea is normal by Pathfinder, we're told that it's basically normal by the back surface, uh, the big D and the, 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 all the little Ds from the Bell and Ambrosio, and we're not sure whether this is significant. Well, we can know straight away. We can look at our epithelial map from OCT and we can say, well, hmm, I'm not sure. It looks kind of even. But then we look at our epithelial map on the insight. And now it's unequivocal. And you know, the insight has the uh, Reinstein Silverman keratoconus algorithm in there from our NIH grant. And so, you know, it says, yes, this is keratoconus. And we're able to, you know, see this in advance. Um, this patient may have gone through to surgery because the epithelial thickness profile looks even, right, on OCT. So in our clinic, every single patient that walks through the door gets topography and tomography, and every single patient gets an epithelial map from OCT. But still, a good 10 to 12% of our patients still get ultrasound diagnosis because sometimes it goes further and it helps us exclude cases that are actually keratoconic, but it actually helps us rule in cases that an OCT can't tell us is not keratoconic because the epithelial map isn't precise enough. So on to the big, uh, the big subject here, which is the posterior chamber, right? And that's the ICL. And, you know, I don't have to mention this, but obviously we don't want oversized ICLs because that's a bad long-term problem pigment dispersion, angle closures, and we don't want undersized lenses because of the risk of cataract. And yes, the Aquaport, which you don't quite yet have in the US, but you're about to get, it made a massive difference to the anterior subcapsular caps, uh, capsular cataract rates, massive difference. But as Roberto Saldivar, who has the most experience with ICLs in the world, will tell us, even with the hole, you can sometimes see circular 
anterior capsule of cataract because the ICL is too close and there is, you know, just not enough circulation in the mid peripheral area where the ICL is thickest and it's still abutting against the crystalline lens. So we still need sizes. And in the early days when Gonvers was raising the alarm about how, you know, 90 microns is the minimum acceptable, otherwise you're going to get cataract. Yeah, all that is kind of a bit old fashioned, but now we really need um, a, a different, a different set of rules for sizing because it's no longer about avoiding an exchange. Now it's about putting the lens in that's the ideal size so that in the long term it, it does the best it can for that patient. Now, correlations with the sulcus were things that were heralded by Carlo Lovizzolo, uh, my, my, my uh, teacher in ICL, my original teacher, um, but others in, you know, Daugherty in the States used his FDA data to publish a nomogram that showed that was way better than white to white um, using his sulcus to sulcus method. And with Lobizolo, we did a number of studies of this sort, but we had already done a lot of anterior segment analysis. And I, I just want to share with you a couple of interesting um, uh, um, statistics. So what we looked at was um, with high frequency ultrasound, we looked at the correlation of being able to predict the sulcus from the white to white or from the angle, because, you know, the big thing, oh, the OCTs are going to be better for ICL sizing. And it was like, well, is it? I mean, you can predict the sulcus diameter from white to white, and you'll only have 38% of the eyes within that have a, an error of more than a half millimeter. Well, that's a whole lens size different for the ICL. If you use the angle diameter, yeah, it is better, but you still have 32% of eyes with more than a half millimeter diameter in error of predicting the sulcus which is a lens size. We tried a multivariate regression analysis model using all of the measurements that you could possibly get from the anterior segment. And if you had a multivariate and used ACD and angle, you could get it down to 26% with, you know, only with a half millimeter error, which is useless for predicting sulcus, right? That's a quarter of the eyes with an error of more than a half. So if you look at the insight repeatability, which is 120 microns of lateral repeatability, the chances of having an error of more than half diopter drops to less than 1%. So this is our preliminary work, right? We were saying, well, obviously measuring the sulcus directly is going to be 25 times better than using any form of highly sophisticated multivariate regression analysis of trying to indirectly predict the sulcus diameter. And we did this work. And with Carlo, we published um, a paper. Um, hang on a second there. Uh, we published a paper here where we showed that in 54% of the eyes, we used a different lens using sulcus to sulcus sizing than we would have used had we gone just from the, the Star Ocos website. <sighs> Well, that's, a, that's half the eyes, right? But it went further, right? Because Star were saying, well, handheld ultrasound only gets the same results as white to white, so there's no point in using it. And you had companies that were saying, well, you know, it is better if you're a well-trained individual, you can get good handheld scans. But there was a lot of inter-observer inter um, variability with handheld devices. Um, Obviously, the disadvantages being that the patient, you know, has to ha either have an immersion cup put in, which is rather uncomfortable, or a condom put over, but then, you know, that kind of squashes the eye a little bit, might, uh, might distort uh, the anatomy. Um, and, you know, not to mention this, but the resolution is lower, okay, because um, we are raising the standard with this high resolution robotic scanner. And that is quite easily seen. You're going to lean forward. This is a this is a video demonstrating that the whole scan sequence is done in two minutes. And so, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's such a pain in the ass. But actually, it's a lot less inconvenient than a handheld device where you have to lie the patient down and put a, a cup in and put some coupling medium in. The whole scan in our clinic now takes two minutes, two minutes per eye. And it's 
really, really very, very, very easy to do. I have all of my technicians. I have eight technicians for all our scanning, and they're all trained, and they can all do insight uh, scans themselves. Carlo very uh, laboriously went through all of the handheld devices and demonstrated the repeatability of the sulcus. Uh, his preferred device was the Sonomed at the time, but then he was able to get uh, an Artemis II actually uh, um, in, in Milan and was working with that. And with the Insight, of course, we managed to get far higher repeatability because of the robotic uh, scanning being much more accurate. So comparing the resolution of what's called high frequency ultrasound with what I will call very high frequency ultrasound, um, it, it, they're, they're not comparable. You cannot see the same level of detail within the posterior chamber, which is where you want the detail to be able to see where foot plates are lying and to be able to measure um, ciliary body uh, sulcus to sulcus distances. It just isn't easy to find those fiducial points with lower resolution. And as I mentioned, our analysis of where these foot plates go taught us a lot about how to do this surgery better. In fact, my variability in foot plate position now is much, much lower than it was before we started studying where all of these things go. So understanding these tilted outliers that we think might need exchanging because the angle's lower, well, I actually can do this scan and know that I only have to do is go into surgery and just push that old foot plate down onto the zonular plane. And then I don't have to do an exchange and I don't have to sacrifice endothelium. And it's a much quicker operation and it's much easier. So let's finish off here by talking about uh, our new sizing model. And, you know, just recapping here, STAR has used white to white with a couple of those, like remember that regression analysis for the anterior chamber, AC depth. Okay, Lovizolo and then Doherty introduced the nomogram for sulcus to sulcus. And then Kojima in, in Japan said, well, yeah, sulcus to sulcus is good, but let's add the sulcus to sulcus lens rise because the higher the lens, well, the closer it'll get to the back surface of the ICL. So we were using our insight with the Kojima formula, and we were hoping to get better results than Kojima. Well, because we're using VHF digital ultrasound, not just HF digital, HF ultrasound, right? And in our studies, we then went and did a retrospective analysis of our sizing and found after a few, we, we had about, I think we had 42 eyes in the first analysis. And we found something shocking. We found that a measurement which I had randomly just thrown in to the multivariate analysis ended up being the most powerful predictor of ICL sizing. And that is something which I randomly called the ciliary body inner diameter. And I thought it was gonna be pointless, I'll tell you why, because ciliary um, processes are floating around sometimes and you, you can catch them on a scan and then not if you're in a crypt. So I was like, well, that's going to be useless, but let's throw it in anyway. And anyway, ciliary body inner diameter with the scotopic pupil pre-op and the sulcus to sulcus lens rise turns out to be the golden tri triangle for ICL power. And it turns out that sulcus to sulcus out the window doesn't work anymore. In fact, we couldn't even jam it into an equation because it once the ciliary body inner diameter was in there, it was so much more predictive of, sulcus to, uh, of, of the ICL volt height that you couldn't get the sulcus to sulcus in as well. So, and it's a shame because this work was done just after Carlo uh, passed away from his uh, very tragic brain tumor. And, you know, this is what we were all working together, him and I together for 20 years on. And so in his honor, we're, um, we're, uh, we're actually um, looking at how we can make some income for his family from this work, even though he didn't manage to see it to the end. But you see, here's another paradigm shift in the way we've been thinking, because all of these formulas, uh, they give you a recommended lens size, right? And we were like, well, hang on a second. I mean, some eyes are deeper chambers, some are narrower, some are angles are wider, some angles are narrower. Why don't we, why can't we choose the ICL to put in based on where it's going to end up? And so we give you a the predicted volt for each of the four sizes that you can buy. And then you decide which one to use. 
And let me show you how that works in a minute. But first, let me just go over our formula and just show you how incredible it's worked out. And we're in version two now. So our training set, like I said, was in 42 eyes. We then uh, used that formula to do another 36 eyes. And then we used all of the eyes to do another version. Um, and then we did another 69 eyes with that version two formula. So here's very high frequency ultrasound with an insight 100 using the Kojima. And you can see that we got a mean volt of about 500 and our interquartile range was 390 microns, but our top to bottom was 800 microns. That was using Kojima. When we analyzed those eyes and formulated formula one and then did the next set of eyes, our interquartile range went down to 169 microns. And when we reanalyzed and did our formula two, it went down to 131 microns. Our top to bottom, our highest to lowest ICL, they were only separated by 573 microns, the top and the bottom. So when we compare, let's just, we're, we're just gonna add these two groups together even though actually the formula two does better, but let's just add formula one and two together and, 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 and conglomerate them and now compare them to what each of the other formulas would have given us. And we find that, well, all of them obviously have a much higher spread. So it's the outliers, remember, that cause the exchange surgery, not the, not, it doesn't matter if it's a bit over, a bit under, but if it's way over or way under is when you need to do your second surgery, and that's a problem. But you can see that the OCT-based formulas do not do very well. Um, and STAR obviously does the worst because it's always, it, it oversizes massively. Everyone, a lot of people just automatically take one size down from the STAR prediction uh, to stay safe. But you can see that with our model calculated values, we're doing way better with our high frequency ultrasound. In fact, just looking at the interquartile ranges, we're, you know, like really, really several times better. And this translates into clinical safety. Because when we look at what lens we would have chosen with each of these formulas in the same eye, we find a lot of discrepancy. In fact, 17% of the eyes, we would have chosen a lens that is two sizes different from the one that we used if we had just relied on the OCOS website from STAR. Now, here's an example of that. Here's a 25-year-old female, and we calculate the recommended size by all the other formulas, and based on our formula, we chose a 12.6 because we wanted to leave about 560 microns or so, right? What happened? Well, the patient ended up at 821, 850, 759. So the patient ended up about 250 microns higher than predicted. Okay, well, what, it, what did STAR recommend? Well, STAR recommended 13.7, and that would have given us over 1,000 plus 250, would have been 1,300, now you're talking about narrow angles and a very high volt and a probable exchange surgery in both eyes. So here's an example of an outlier. Yes, she was an outlier with respect to our formula in that she was within 300 microns, but not within 100. But hey, it was pretty close and it certainly avoided an exchange. So our original formula, not quite linearly calibrated, um, but now the formula two is, is very, very nicely um, calibrated between the target and the achieved volt. And here is the achieved and sort of the accuracy of volt, if you like. So with our formula, we've got 61% of the eyes within 100 microns of the predicted volt. And we had 96% of the eyes within 300 microns of the predicted volt, which is amazing. Now, you know, let's just look at the 100 micron, like this is like the whole bullseye, the hole in one rates. And you can see that, you know, obviously we're doing better than everyone, way better than OCT. And yes, you know, OCT is okay. And yes, it's better than STAR, 
but it's nowhere near as well, it does as well as measuring directly in the posterior chamber. That's not like, an, that's not meant to be rude about OCT. It's meant to be obvious, right? If you're measuring where you're going to put the lens as opposed to measuring somewhere else and then assuming a, a measurement behind the iris, well, clearly you're not gonna get it right as often. It's kind of basic logic, right? So we put our formula into this website, iclsizing.com. We based it on the ASRS calculator concept for the IOLs, where basic, based on how much data you put in, so you will get all of the or some of the uh, formulas um, being calculated for you. For our formula, as I showed you, you just need the sulcus to sulcus lens rise, the ciliary body inner diameter, and the scotopic pupil size, and obviously the power of the lens, and it will give you the, the four sizes and what the volt is expected. So that's free to use for anybody. And, you know, I want to just finish by just, um, you know, iterating the fact that this highly engineered device is now able to measure and, and image the entire capsule and zonules and measure volume. And so operating behind the dark side of the moon now gets and becomes a reality. It's, it's actually a reality. Volume of lens, diameter of capsule, these are elements that have hampered accommodative IOL science because, you know, the, the haptic length is relevant if you've got a mechanically driven accommodative lens. So possibly this technology will enable accommodative lenses to become more effective and more predictable, particularly as this, you know, equatorial diameter is so precisely determined by this robotic uh, scanning system. And as I mentioned earlier, we're in the throes of beginning a study, prospective study, where we're looking at zonular anatomy, and we're trying to see if we can actually get into this ELP uh, problem in a way that has never been achieved before. And everyone, you read all of the best people who know everything about IOL, Norby, the Norby review paper, you read all of these papers, and they all admit it. The biggest problem with IOL power calculation is not knowing where the effective lens possession is going to go. And it's it's about 25% of the accuracy problem. So it doesn't matter whether you use air, ray tracing or AI or whatever you think you're going to use to get it better. Measuring directly where things are going to go, obviously, is going to give us better results than predicting it from other, from other parameters. So, you know, in summary, Yes, we have lots of OCT applications that overlap with ultrasound, but actually ultrasound has its unique uses, particularly in the posterior chamber, but it, as a better way of getting definitive diagnoses in the cornea, in the epithelium, intrastromally, when our OCTs don't quite make it for us, even though they're very convenient and wonderful devices to use. So the highest standard of care is to be using both technologies not just one of them. And, you know, the advantage is that the ultrasound one is actually a lot less expensive than the OCT one. So it turns out that it's not that bad a deal. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope that was um, uh, of, of, uh, of particular interest. Um, and I, I suppose I, I will take questions if anybody uh, is there. Otherwise, um, thank you very much. And I, I'd be very happy to answer any questions that any, anyone wants to email me. My email's in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Thank you.